McCoy on his own. He gets the try. The Red 78. We're both monster people. Gets over the line. Try for monster. Nobody knows monster rugby better. Hello and welcome along. I'm Alan Quinlan and you're listening to episode 60 of the Red 78 here on the Rugby Channel. And with me as always is, is Neve Briggs. Uh, incredibly hard news to digest uh, the, the latter part of last week. Uh, Neve, I know uh, both of us um, knew Tom Tierney very well. Um, we go back a long way. He was a very popular character and uh, there was a consideration from both of us, just from the listeners here, not to do the podcast at all this week because um, I didn't know how I could come on here and, and talk about Tom and um, I know you were quite emotional about it as well Nee, with your connection with Tom you know I go back to to playing uh, under 18s I captained the Irish under 18 team captained the Munster under 18 team and Tom was my scrum half I was number eight um, he was only 16 at the time he was two years younger than me and he was um about a year and a half, but he was still under 16s when he played in the Irish under 18s and the Munster under 18s. And right from the word go, I can always remember Tom being full of joy, fun, crack, um, mad for uh, a giggle. Um, great, great um, character he was. And obviously he's passing last Friday morning, Thursday, Thursday night, Friday morning. Uh, was shocking for for everybody to hear in the rugby community because Tom was a very popular person, but also very incredibly shocking for his family, his his wife Mary and and their two kids. Um, it's hard to digest it, isn't it? It's hard to kind of put into words because this is the second time this has happened. One of our, you know, rugby teammates who's gone too young with with um after Axel in two thousand sixteen. So it's uh Jerry Holland passed away a few months ago as well. Um, so there's there's three people there who were heavily involved in my career that that have passed away, and and Tom is the latest, and it's it's incredibly sad. Yeah, hugely. I think we've uh, we both have we spoke on the phone last night. We both have a lot of memories. Um, you know, he was a part of our group in terms of coaching us. We won a Six Nations with him in 2015, and um, you know, I think the outpouring of grief and. Uh, the love and support for him over the last few days, I'm sure, will be a huge comfort to their fa- to his family. And um, yeah, look, it's just very, very, very sad news. Um, it's something that um, we, you know, our WhatsApp group on Friday morning. It was, it was, we we heard the news there, and we were obviously devastated to hear that. Um, but. Every one of our my former teammates um, were always obviously were incredibly shocked, but it's amazing the amount of people who all said that Tom was just great fun. He was always wanting to have a laugh and a joke. He didn't take life that serious. Um, even I listened to Ben Kay and Austin Healy at the weekend on on their Six Nations coverage in in um, I think they were they were in Cardiff for for ITV and. Uh, there, I think there was Gallagher Premiership on Friday night that they were doing as well. And I just listened to to what Ben Kay was saying about he, Tom's time with Leicester and um, how much of a character he was, how popular he was in the dressing room. Um, you know, he Tom started out with Richmond in, in Limerick, a junior club. Seen, they went senior at one stage, but uh, Gary Owen as well. Monster, Leicester, Galwegians, Connacht. Um, and more recently, he was... Um, now, since he retired, he was coaching with Crescent Comprehensive, uh, Gary Owen, Cork Con, the Ireland club side. Um, he's been employed by the RFU since 2014, working with the Irish under-19s, under-20s, the Irish senior women's team, as you said, um, as head coach. And he won a 2006 Nations and, and he was coach of the World Cup as well. And recently, he's been working as a, a national talent, talent coach and based out of the high performance center in Limerick and, you know, chatting to some of the staff, even there just saying that Tom was loving life. He was loving the job. A lot of the under twenties players on Friday night that we saw playing against Italy, Tom would have worked with them. Um, a lot of those players were, were, were very much affected as well. So Tom kind of touched so many people and in, in all levels, he coached um, in my junior club, Clan William as well in Tipperary. 
So he he just loved going out onto the field with the boots on and, and coaching people and having fun and, and there was always a bit of joy to that as well. So it's um it's very it's a very difficult one to comprehend and it's gonna be a very tough couple of days for for obviously first and foremost for Tom's family and close friends. Um but it's a shock and it's something that you know that I was thinking, how would you pay tribute to Tom? Um I just think he was he was just a great character. He was someone I always liked being around. Um, he was a brilliant player, made his debut for Ireland in Australia in 99. And my first cap with Ireland in 99 um, against Romania at the World Cup, Tom scored a try there. And uh, it was, you know, Tom, he was slagging me and trying to get me to down drinks after the match, that old tradition of your first cap. But luckily enough, we were, the team were playing Argentina four or five days later in, in Lons. And uh, I got protected a little bit, but Tom was driving the charge and, and getting, uh, even only as a young fellow, but he was a great character. I remember being in Scotland in the Ireland under 18 team in 1993. That's a long time ago now, Neef. And uh, we, we were beaten by Scotland. We played at international. And uh, the night before the game, Tom had a, he was going doing a little bit of sleepwalking. And I heard this kerfuffle outside my room and I came out and Tom was kind of walking around half asleep. There was no drink involved. This was the night before the game. So he was uh, a naked Tom Tierney as a 16-year-old walking around the corridor of the hotel. He locked himself out of his room. But they were the kind of funny stories. And uh, I was actually going to ask Frankie Sheehan to come on because... um, but then we'd probably dedic- we'd do the whole podcast telling funny stories about Tom. But Frankie was was someone who who um who always kind of had a great connection with Tom because Frankie was such a messer as well. And Tom loved it. And one of the things the boys used to do when they were on the bench after we won a game with Munster, um Frankie uh, this is around 2000 when Woody was playing ahead of Frankie. Frankie was on the bench, I was on the bench, and Tom was on the bench. And Frankie hatched this plan that we would, uh, after the game, when you know, if, was, if we won, that we'd run out onto the field and we'd celebrate like as if we played the 80 minutes ourselves and start jumping and you know, fist pumping and all that stuff because the cameraman would be out there. So that was that was the challenge that Frankie set and Tom loved it. We'd run out onto the field and we'd be hugging and kissing everyone. And um, <laughs> I was slow to do it, but Frankie loved it and, and so did Tom. And it was just, th- those things make me make me laugh. Um, but um, yeah, it's, it's incredibly difficult to comprehend that someone at 46 can, can go like this. And I just might... My thoughts and prayers are with Mary and the kids. It's so difficult to even even talk about it and realize that you know people are still in shock about it. But the only consolation out of any anything like this when it happens is that you know the the fond memories and the stories and and it's not lip service to say that Tom you know was a nice fella and he was he was a great character because that's that's a common thread across everyone I've spoken to since that. He was such great fun and joy to be around. Yeah, hugely. I think when I think he turned 40 when he was coaching us. So for his birthday, we got him a big cake as a surprise, but also the girls rocked out with a, a bottle of hair dye. And um, I think if you know Tom as well as I do, he uh, loved to look good and um, was always pumping iron in the gym to make sure that he, he was good and the shorts were rolled up. So we got a big skin out of that. He did too, to be fair. But um. Yeah, look, it's, it's, it is hard to make sense, but he, he was definitely the glue that held a lot of people together in terms of dressing rooms, in terms of squads. Um, you know, and you just you just said something to me yesterday, Eve, about he was one, uh, about traveling around the country doing what he was doing. Just t- tell the listeners about that. <laughs> yeah, so when he, when he got a name as head coach, he, you know, it was very different times then. You know, you only got to train for three or four weekends uh, before our Six Nations and. Tom really felt that we couldn't benefit from that. We needed to increase our skill and our fitness and took it upon himself. It was one thing and it's one remaining thing. We spoke about it um, on Friday as well as a group that every week, you know, Monday he'd be in Galway, Tuesday he'd be in Limerick, Wednesday he'd be in uh, Dublin and Thursday he'd be in Belfast and he would drive to Belfast for one player and he would 
tell that player to bring a few really, you know, the best of those club club mates or whatever, and you would just do skills and conditioning with them. And every week the sessions were horrific. You'd be running and running, and then you'd come back in. It was awful, but it was brilliant. And you know, it was it was huge. And that was the first time we had somebody consistently do that week in week out, and and we had the benefit from it. You know, we won at Six Nations in 2015. We got to a Grand Slam decider in 2016 uh, on Paddy's Day against England. And and then obviously, you know, the, the World Cup speaks for itself. But that wasn't, uh, you know, his legacy in terms of what a good coach he was. I think it was it was just lots of moving parts not working. And um, um, But I was delighted, to, you know, to see him go into that, that national coaching role. He felt, you know, he had a huge amount of... Um, huge amount to give back to younger players. He absolutely loved the development side of it. He loved working with those younger lads of so 16, 17, 18 year olds before they went into academy, before they went into that professional sense. He felt that he could definitely help and work with them. And you look at like the likes of Ethan Coughlin and Jack Oliver, you know, Jake Rin in, in art school, if I hear that name once more, he kept talking about how brilliant he's going to be and how excellent he is and um and all these guys. And um yeah, look, I think, you know, when you saw it over the weekend and lad, young lads and that were playing for their AIL clubs and, and their twenties and you know it, it meant a huge amount to them that they got to work with him. So um yeah, look, it was it's um it's just awful tragic. And there was a lot of the under twenties, as I said on Friday night. Um uh, Evan O'Connell, who came off the bench, had Tom's name on his kind of strapping around his legs for his line outs and you know, Danny Sheehan and Jacob Sheehan, they were only he was only doing a session with them I think a week or two ago and uh he was with Munster last Thursday, working as normal and out in the field coaching. So, um, you know, I talked to Mike Prendergast this week or on Friday about Tom and he was just obviously an incredible shock, but loving the fact that Tom was around because he brought this kind of bit of crack and bit of fun. And it wasn't as if he, Tom was, um, uh, you know, um, a messer all the time, but he just, I, I can never remember him not having a smile on his face when I met him and having a little bit of slagging and he loved going out in the field coaching. And I think Prendy was telling me, look, they loved Tom was back around her because he was a great character. And he said all the younger players loved him. They just loved him that he's his sessions he was doing. He wasn't putting too much pressure on him. And obviously, you know, as a coach, it's different when you're out going out doing skill sessions and you're not actually preparing a team for the weekend. You're not having to pick guys, drop guys, so I think Tom loved the fact that he just went out and put on the boots and did skills with people. And, uh, and um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's just so sad and it's so difficult to comprehend. Um, and as I said, it's going to be a tough couple of days for his family and friends. But um, we won't forget Tom. May he rest in peace. And uh, you know, he was so, so, so popular with everybody. Um, Neve, we got to move on. We have some tweets and um, a couple of messages there. Um, just about um, Tom, uh, the match at the weekend, the Italian match, and uh, looking ahead to the, the, the Munster Scarlets game on Friday night, which is a really important game. Um, obviously, there's been so many tributes put up on online, and that's that can be one of the advantages. You see the warmth that people um, portray when, when something like this happens. I think James Ryan um, mentioning Tom in his interview after the game was just a lovely, lovely touch. It shows the measure of the man, James Ryan. He's a he's a top, he's a top top fella. I think he's um, obviously a brilliant player, and he's had a you know a very important player for Leinster in Ireland. But for him to come out like that and just the first thing in his mind was to to mention Tom, and that is the great thing about rugby. I think we'll see in the next few days there'll be people from all over Ireland at Tom's funeral and uh, I just love the fact the Irish captain there he just he 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 gave a great tribute to Tom there and it was it was lovely um you have some messages there about the match at the weekend and and a couple about Tom as well yeah look there's lots of regular listeners just passing on their their condolences um JJ Casey and John Tui um which is lovely and then um, just to to move to move to the next part of it, um, John spoke about um, months we made hard work of our win in Rome, uh, held up over the line again. It was very good win despite our injury profile. Ringrose's absence highlighted his importance to the team. 
nobody in Ireland defends the 13 channel better. Only Tony Fresh comes close. I still can't believe we're calling him Tony Fresh, by the way. Um, and then he went on to say that we need to get five points on Friday. The return of the big Safa will dominate the coverage. I hope he has put his injury was behind him. If we win three of our last four matches, we might take fourth. Then it'll be Glasgow or Ulster, depending on how much bottle there, how much boats bottle their remaining games. Uh, Tom Lundergan, Italy are a growing Six Nations force. No pushover anymore. They don't run out of gas on the hour either. Italy did the same to France, so a bonus point win was required and we got the job done in Rome. The under-20s looked the real deal too. Tip man Brian Gleeson, a massive contribution, scored the first try but must have won four turnovers in the first half alone. Scarlets are on the back of six straight wins, so always a threat even without their three internationals. A bonus point win, a must. Um, Just a a couple of things there in relation to to the 20s. That Munster contingent, they're doing really well. I don't know if you got to watch the game, but I did, Brian yeah. Gleeson and uh, Ruan starting and doing so, so well. And then obviously the two Sheens coming off the bench and Evan. I thought it, it was great. It was great to see it. I think obviously Ruan's in the, the academy, but I think there must be you know, an Evan. But I think Brian Gleeson must be a shoe going into the summer, really. Um, just a, such a physical specimen and his ability to get in over the ball is so, so good. Yeah, he's incredibly powerful, and that peel around the line out there where he where he scored yeah. that try so hard to stop. Um, it's a very exciting team, and it's a very physical team. And Richie Murphy's done a brilliant job with them. Um, I know we're doing a monster podcast, but there's there's so many good players in this team, and it's brilliant to see. Um, and obviously, you know you have Ruin Quinn, Brian Gleans, Gleeson, Danny Sheehan, Evan O'Connell. Um and Jake, and like Evan, be... Evan, Evan, and Ruin are, are playing a year on young, like they're still underage again next year, which is huge, um, for them and their development. So, um, but yeah, I agree. The way they're playing the game, it's so exciting to watch. I think at that age, it's not really about patterns and structures, and it must be a really difficult type of a team to coach because there's no momentum or there's no carryover really following year. You're literally dealing with whole new groups every single season, and that's a skill in itself. So I agree. I think um, fair play to Richie. Um, yeah, he's done, he's done a brilliant job. Um, and the what others. Do you, what do you think of the the before we went to we couple of things on on YouTube, but what do you make of the um, the interesting comments around? I heard a lot of people speak about it this weekend in relation to that thirteen channel that if Ring Rose isn't there. It's a lot to expect. Defending thirteen is the hardest position on the pitch. But, um, you know, is Anton Frisch? Then, you know, the, should he be in there in terms of the, you know, an, an able backup for Gary Ringrose? I think after what happened at the weekend, yeah. And look, he was on the yeah. Emerging Ireland tour. Uh, James Hume was another player who had a brilliant finish to the season with Ulster last year. He went on that tour to New Zealand, got a bad hamstring or groin injury, I groin, think, in the yeah ended up having an operation. So he's had a tough time of it. Ulster have obviously struggled kind of December, January, hasn't helped. Um, he's picked up another couple of injuries. So he's still a, he's a brilliant player, James Hume. So I think okay. if you're thinking who 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 could play there if 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 Gary Ringwells doesn't play? Well, obviously, I think Bundy Aki um, hasn't played a lot of rugby. So number one, fitness-wise, I think he, he was... The game was so fast and it is a difficult position. So you've got to give him a pass on that one. It's it's non-stop running, moving, defending, watching everything. There's so much to that 13 channel. Um if he's not if 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 Bundyaki's not playing, if Gary Ringer's is not there, I think well, the most obvious one then is uh, Robbie Henshaw, who's played there before and can play there and probably would be more used to it than Bundyaki. Bundyaki had a really good game um, with the ball in hand, but it's, I think, obviously Italy's attack and the tempo and the pace of the game at times and that connection between himself and James Lowe, there was a few issues there and, and Italy exposed them. So, um, you know, I think Anton Frisch is someone who's incredibly exciting, wants to play for Ireland. I think France have been trying to get him to to come back and declare from them. Um, I think he's the most like for like at the moment yeah. um, with his pace and his physicality and his frame and everything. Um, he's a really it's he's a brilliant just, player. It's his, it's his ability to read the game though. I think he's very similar to Gary Ringrose in that in terms of 
you ever watch Ring Rose, it almost looks like he's got a license to do what he wants, but it's because he's so good at anticipating the play. And I think that Anton Frisch is very similar to that. I thought Ireland were really lucky that they weren't playing a team, uh, France or, uh, you know, where they're one line break and score, even a Scotland, because I just thought um, that 13 channel was was very open. All yeah, it was difficult for him. And it I think, um, yeah. you know, given that Robbie, Robbie Henshaw's not back and that uh, James Hume isn't available, um, um, wasn't in the squad, uh, Anton Frisch wasn't in the squad, um, I think they'll have learned a lot. I think it's been a brilliant couple of weeks for Andy Farrell and his team because they've learned a lot about their players. They've been missing probably up to seven players who are, are front liners. Um, just on the game itself, I think if we look back, um, to, I always try to do positives and negatives. The positives for any team is five points, uh, five, um, you know, getting the bonus point win as well. Um, really, really important. I said last week, one score, two scores would be loads Italy have improved dramatically and the evidence is there to back that up what they did last year in the Six Nations beating Wales November they beat Australia Samoa they ran France incredibly close in that first game so they're a very dangerous side and improving a lot and that's what we want um, I think the one thing that would obviously be a big negative here is the missed tackles there's 24 missed tackles for Ireland um, you're always going to have a, a number of missed tackles in the game and probably the number was pretty high against France as well. And their scramble and their work rate, we talk about their fitness. Um, they do if they miss. But there was a few line breaks and there was a few concerning ones and, and particularly around that area that we're talking about. So I think they'll have learned a lot and I think it was a really good win. I thought Ireland showed yeah. composure. I wouldn't be overly critical here because it didn't surprise me in any way how Italy played and how dangerous they can be. We could have been punished more if... if um, if uh, if Italy were a bit more clinical, I think Ignacio Brex did this cross field yeah. kick and was it sixty seven or eight minutes? Yeah, and he had an overlap. It was twenty seven twenty at that stage. It was so like that a five v two. Yeah, it was a nervy period until it Matt was. Hansen scored the try. But um, yeah, you know, there's. I think, I think too for me, we we missed a lot. Obviously, we missed Gary Ringrose a huge amount, but I thought we missed Tyke Byrne exceptionally uh, 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 would like as in I, I I I was surprised that not many people have talked about it afterwards. I really do. I think we missed his ability to um obviously his lineup ability and, and James Ryan's really, really good at the lineup, but I it was his work it's his work on the ground, his ability to slow the ball down at times. There was a lot of um quick ball there in relation to, to Italy and we just couldn't get near it at times and I just felt like we missed him a lot, I think. Um and and it's not any disrespect to Ian Henderson at all. I just feel like Mike Byrne's a different type of player. And I thought that for, we spoke about it last week about the Ryan Baird, Ian Henderson um, debate. And for me, I think Ryan Henderson is, or Ian, Ryan, Ryan Baird, sorry, is the most like for like from a Mike Byrne point of view in terms of athletically being able to get in over the ball and be able to carry and be able to go to the line and be able to move those little passes. Um, I think when you play Ian Henderson together with uh James Ryan, you're almost getting a like for like in terms of, you know, those unseen locks that just do all the dirty work. Like James Ryan hits an enormous amount of um, rocks. He hits an enormous amount of defensive rocks. He puts an awful lot of pressure on scrum halves from that point of view. And I think Ian Henderson's kind of a bit of a like for like for that at the moment because I don't think he's played enough rugby and he's obviously had his injury uh, issues. So we don't see that big, powerful specimen that's raging onto the ball as much anymore. Um, so, yeah, I, I do think we missed Tyke Byrne a lot um, in around those areas. The Ireland were missing seven, was it seven or eight know, players? Tyke Byrne, uh, Tyke Furlong, Gibson Park, Henshaw, Keane Healy. Even though Keane Healy did the warm-up, Dave Kilcoyne got, got, you know, was picked there on the bench. Johnny Sexton, Gary Ringrose. Am I missing mm -hmm. anyone else? I think Robert yeah. Balakoon is someone who's um has been in has injured and he could come back into the the you know get close to that Irish team again. Earl D then is probably the same. Uh, Keith Earls, Andrew Conway. Um, yeah. So it's I think they've done, so they, they, they've done really yeah. well, and I think Finley yeah. Beelham going off is a shame for Finley because I think he's he's been brilliant. I think he's been absolutely brilliant, and it was just a pity, and you could see. 
He was trying everything to stay on the field, yeah. um, which is a shame. He's done exceptionally well over the last few weeks. Brilliant. He I, 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 he, he's brilliant. He's been people brilliant. At ease. Yeah. People and at Tom ease. O'Toole, to be fair, has come in. So, really well. yeah. as regards preparation for Andy Farrell, lots of things have just, even though he's had setbacks, but there's lots of questions being asked about certain players and it's... Yeah. It's been really positive. So, like, can I just give you two um two emails that came in in relation yeah. to the game? So, um, Graham Shaw mentions on YouTube. I'm glad Quinny mentioned Paul O'Connell and Fogarty in regards selection. They have a huge input and they know all these monster lads well. So no blue bias or any rubbish like that. We need to let that go. Explain to me what that's about. It it's probably means you know when we were talking about um, uh, Gavin Coombs. Um, oh, okay. not being selected and Scott Penny and maybe John yeah. Hodnett should have been called in you know they do I, I would never think and I could I could say this with confidence that Paul would look at someone provincially and go well he's a monster guy I'm going to pick him over Let's, he picks yeah, the best yeah. player and I 100%. truly believe that and he picks it on the evidence of the small finer details that a lot of us don't probably see at times so um, Scott Penny even though we debated this last week you know John Hodner has been starting for months from European games and playing really well uh, maybe it's down to a little bit of detail that John Hodner, um needs to get better at um, so who knows and Gavin Coombs needs to get better at people shout and kind of roar and it is quite frustrating when it's Munster Leinster and people are kind of using that bias one way or the other to, to, to you know I think as a provincial player, you have to, when you go with Ireland, you have to separate it. And, 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 and that's the way I thought as a player. And no matter how much the rivalry is there, and I can understand the fans um, are trying to stick up for their own players. Um, so I think that's what he means. That's, you know, yeah. That that's that's thought, what Graham means. That's, that's you know, just so, it's just, yeah, just I'm, finer I'm, details. Yeah. Uh, John and Cork has, uh, emailed in to say, just a few thoughts on the Ireland win. Personally, I don't think it was as bad as some are making out. I don't know who's making it out to be bad, but if you remove all force choice players from 9, 10, 12, 13 block down, from the 9, 10, 12, 13 block, then any team will struggle. Also, we don't have an international level 13. McCluskey, Aki and Henshaw are all amazing, but they're all 12s. I think management need to get Hume or Frisch in in case Ringrose goes down again. I thought Lowe was good at times, but there were shades of the 2021 James Lowe again. A few defensive howlers, and my God, the boy is slow for a winger. Harsh. He shouldn't have been awarded the try in, in France, so you could argue he has left three or four tries out there in recent games by not being able to burn his opposite man. Do we possibly need more speed out there? I thought it was a brain dead decision at 24 17 with the bonus in the bag to not kick for three. I'm wondering about Conan under this management. He seems to me to be a more bludgeon type player and not really suited to the Farrell cat mantra. Finally, I thought the Italians lay on the ground on our side of the rock all day long and got away with it. Thanks, John and Quirk. That is, there's a lot in that. Okay, so first of all, I actually think that James Lowe provides a huge amount for this squad. I think he's powerful. Um, I do think he's quick. And I think that he was... I think he was put under pressure defensively this weekend because of Aki and and just that, you know, not being used to playing 12, 13 and wing together, Aki not being used to playing 13. There was lots of issues there. I just don't think you can hang your head on James Lowe. Yeah, but Bundy think, Aki is not a 13. He's a 12. And he's yeah, a and I wouldn't 12. mind. I, I actually thought James Lowe, I thought James Lowe should have been more than a man of match the other day. I thought he was really good in terms of everything that he does. So... Um, but everybody's entitled to their opinion. I totally get it. But I actually thought James Lowe was was good last weekend and the last couple of games. Yeah, I I, I think James Lowe is a brilliant player. I think mm. he's improved. He's defensive. He had a few little issues, but there was that was um, you know, the circumstances around him. He's so comfortable yeah. with Gary Ringrose, and and it is a really yeah. tough position to play. I think talking about Frisch and and James Hume there is very relevant to John. Is yeah, saying. we spoke about that there. Um, um watching about the twenty four seventeen. Well, wondering about Jack Conan. Um, I think Jack Conan is a very skillful player, and he's an evasive player. And again, it's unfair to kind of tarnish guys after this. This was a tough game, um, and it's a more positive result than people actually that some people are making out. 
24 17. Yeah, again, if you go to the corner, win the line out, score a try, it's the right decision. But if you don't, um, you should have kicked the penalty. But I think they kicked the penalty at, at 24 20. Obviously, um, it's a le- getting a little bit scary that period of time. Um, if Ireland don't give the intercept away um, for Bruno's try before half time, I think there's a different complexion in this game. It gave the Italians yeah. a lot of comfort and hope. But their work rate was through the roof. They're tackling. John has mentioned I'm not rolling away. Well, I tell you, maybe there's a few cases, um, a few points on that. But their physicality around the fringes, they smashed Ireland. So, you know, again, Ireland will probably look back at this and they'll take a lot from it. Um, I think it's brilliant to see see the Italians back and back in, back in action. Okay, we got to move on for that. It was another good win for the 20s and for Ireland. Mm-hmm. Um we're going to move on to this weekend. Um, again, we don't have a team, but we know or we think we're hearing, and it's up on the Monster, um, you know, Twitter page that RG Snyman is available for selection and back training. Yeah. Uh, Monster plays Scarlets on Friday night in Cork, and we've mentioned a lot about this this these block of these three home games, Ospre- Ospreys, which they won, um, fifty eight seven. Was that the score? I can't remember. It was in the 50s anyway. Yeah. Um, 58-3, was it? And um, Yeah, it was a very... Obviously, we went through that last week. Um, the Scarlets match and the Glasgow match. These three home games that we were talking about in January that were so vital. Well, we were talking... Every game has been, you know, since months we were down around 14th in the league at one stage. But... Um, RG Snyman back on Friday night for the game in Cork. Um, how good will that be to see? Will he be starting? Will he be on the bench? Um, he's played an hour. Monster signed him in 2020 and he's been involved in four games. And that's, if you add up, add, to add up the minutes, it's about 60 minutes. He's had a dreadful time with the two crucial ligament injuries. Um, and everyone wants to see this guy back and hopefully he can come back and, and help Monster finish out the season. He needs a bit of luck as well. Yeah, 100%. I think, I don't know if you've got a chance to go into that Axis Monster thing. Um, I've been, uh, they, they, they're really, really good. I think, we talk about all these reality shows, Next Wing, Drive to Survive. I actually think that this is class because it's very in-depth and it's literally followed. So there's a series on RG, like a series on I so it's a little small it, things. Oh my God, it's so good. But it's a little small, little, like 10 minute clips where it speaks about his rehab. They speak to, you know, Ray, who's the rehab physio. And um, and they we, we get a real insight into all the work he's been putting on off the pitch and, and how mentally tough it must have been for him. But also how they've kept him involved in, in certain things. And also he has these little challenges with, with the physio at the end of every day. Um, and it's, it's, really, it's, it's actually really good. But you could just see over the last few kind of, I suppose, clips of it or whatever, the, the fact that he's now, like the work he's been putting on at the pitch. And, oh my goodness, like, you, you know, you'd really feel for him. You'd really hope that, you know, he, this is behind him. And, you, and I hope that he trusts that the work he's put in has been enough for him. And I think Munster have been really savvy in relation to not pushing things forward, to not rushing things to making sure that he's almost, I suppose, kind of bulletproof in terms of his ability to, to, to you know, to withstand or be robust in relation to, to kicking up knocks. And look, I've no doubt, and you know this, if you've been out for a long period of time and you come back, you're definitely going to pick up stuff. They're going to, they're not going to be big stuff, but there might be stuff that will monitor your load or you might not be, you might be in for a game and out for a game for, for a period of time. But I just think we've got to, Really hope for him for his sake and, and the work that he's put in that you know he gets a, he gets a bit of luck. Do you remember that uh, bonus point win about eighteen months ago over in Scarlets when it happened? Mm. I think one oh, was Scarlets. Br- I was trying to figure out what was Scarlets. Yeah, it was they had a brilliant performance over against a strong Scarlet side and yeah. um, they, uh, a lot of younger players. Um, we weren't expecting them to win. They put in this brilliant performance. RG comes off the bench, uh, one kick kick off and. He's going off again, and I remember thinking the, the, the feeling, the deflation, and the disappointments. And uh, he needs a little bit of good fortune and a little bit of luck. And I think you know he signed a new contract last year, and some people were saying to me, "Well, Munster have been incredibly loyal to him, but I think he could have 
he could have went and he could have decided to go and um, not extended the contract. So I think he's he wants to try and uh, play for Munster and actually get a run in this Munster team. So if they could get him to finish out this season, it's been longer than 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 normal because I think he had another setback with the knee as well. He should have been back a couple of months ago. But um, he's had a dreadful run. He lost his mum during COVID as well. Um, she passed away. So it's been a tough time for him and his, and his wife. Um, but hopefully he can get on that Munster jersey on Friday night and get that bit of feel-good factor, I think. Have Imagine you seen him? Have you met crowd. him much around the place? Yeah, I've seen him. Yeah, I don't really... Like, he's... this. He's physically the biggest person in my life I've ever seen as a specimen. Like, yeah, he's massive. He is, he is huge. But also... You look at him like I don't really know him as well as I know other players, but when you watch him in around the gym and stuff, he's um he's such a popular guy. You you know what I mean? And I think that it's been huge and um, you know, I think he's he's been there now and yeah, you're dead right. Look, you just hope that he gets gets that little bit of luck. But um imagine the crowd, there's only, there's less than 300 tickets left. I think, imagine the noise that if he comes off the bench in Musgrave Park on Saturday and the lift that it will not only give him, but it will also give the players on the pitch. And I think it's, yeah, gorgeous. I think it's important that people don't expect too much because it takes time when you come back. It's not just the injury, it's all the other stuff, fitness, everything. So I think people will just be willing yeah. him on just to try and get through it, enjoy it yeah. and maybe be involved in Glasgow in a couple of weeks and then hopefully be involved in a run-in for Munster. Um, they've put themselves in a much better position, obviously, in the last number of months. And we've we've mentioned that um, at one stage, 14th in the table. They're now fifth on 42 points. Everybody's played 14 games. The calendar has been kind of sorted out with some games again at the weekend. So everyone has played 14 games in the league. Um Munster just outside fourth. Glasgow are two points ahead. Um, Scarlets are back in 14th on 27 points. Um, they've won their last four games in the league, but the first part of the league, um, the early part of the season, well, the first 10 matches have been an absolute disaster for the Scarlets. They had one win, one draw, and eight losses in the first 10 games. Um, really tough, tough situation for them. In their last three games, they've uh, beaten the Dragons, 33-17, beaten Cardiff, 28-22 in Cardiff, beat the Bulls at home, 37-28, and in the last game, they beat Edinburgh, 42-14, scored six tries. So what's, is there, what's changed here? Because they've three guys at the weekend against England, they had three starters, uh, Lee, or two starters, Lee Halfmany, and uh, Ken Kino. Owens, the captain, and Kieran Hardy on the bench. So it's not as if they've ten star, uh, ten players away with the Welsh national squad. Like they might have more players. They do have more players. Obviously, training with Wales. Win Jones played in Edinburgh um, against Scotland. Um, there's a couple of more, obviously, in the squad, but. What what's gone wrong with Scarlets? Well, they've turned it around now, but in the early part of the season they were monster esque. I think they they were very poor. I think a lot to do with um, players being signed back into Scarlets. I think they had a lot of injuries similar to Munster at the start. And it's funny how sometimes you just need one win, one big win in terms of one big rival win or one big performance that you're not expecting, and then all of a sudden you get a little bit of belief. And then you can go on these little mini roles. And they're doing and well in the Challenge Cup as well. They're winning matches yeah, there. Yeah. So, so confidence has changed. Confidence. And, and yeah. um, it's uh, just their coaches, is uh, the, the coaching team. I was just looking at it. Dwayne Peel, I think, is the head coach. He Lee came Bl in this year. Yeah. And Lee, Lee Blackett, they, they added Lee Blackett as a backs and skills coach. He was with Wasps. With Wasps. And he's so, supposed to be very good. Yeah. Like when you look at the. And Ben Franks is their forwards coach, the former former New Zealand prop. So um, you start looking at the players and at the team that played against Edinburgh, you'd Sam Lucy, the Tongan, Vai Fafita, the New Zealand back rower, Sione Kalamafoni, Tongan as well, 122 kilos. And I'm thinking the three of them are in the pack and I'm thinking that's a, a bruising threesome, if you like, and uh, so powerful, so aggressive. 
Gareth Davies, the, the you know great Welsh scrum half, he's he's playing with with the Scarlet Steph Evans there, Johnny McNichol. Costello, Costello no, was the Irish or the Welsh twenties out half last year. Phenomenal yeah. talent. I don't know if you remember watching him play last year. I thought he was unbelievable. Sam Costello. Yeah. So they've got a really good team. Um, the so. the point we're probably making here is um, if Munster underestimate the Scarlets here on Friday and think that. Um, which I don't think they will. I think they're very much mindful of of the 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 turnaround that Scar- Scarlets have made um, in in the last four wins, and that does breed a bit of confidence and self belief. And it's obviously on a four G pitch in Musgrave. Um, they will want to attack, and Munster will need to defend here and kind of lay down a platform. Obviously, on the back of a brilliant win against against uh, the Ospreys, a very dominant win psychologically again. Um, the turmoil still goes on. I think in Welsh rugby they've agreed, the, in principle. But some of the stuff that's even coming out now, the reduction. Did you see the one yesterday? Stuff, yeah, the players money, are going, oh my goodness. Uh, you know the re- what they're being offered and stuff now for players. It's a big worry. So it's a tough situation for them. Um, and you know, stating the obvious again, if Munster win this, um, you know they can. They could maybe get into the top four here and and start thinking about being in the top four, but uh, you can't get carried away here because I keep saying you know Glasgow are coming. I'm totally here after, getting carried away. Well, Glasgow are coming <laughs> here after the Six Nations. You know they pick yeah. all their internationals. They're very strong as well. Uh, lots yeah, yeah. of Scottish internationals, and then the trip to South Africa. But it's positive, and uh, I suppose the big big story is um, is R. G. Snyman. There is other returning players. Just before we finish. Um, you see now we have, yeah, uh, Calvin Nash as uh, back from his injury in Treviso. Jack O'Donoghue is um looks like he's available after a calf injury. Paddy Patterson the same picked up a little a calf injury in the Ospreys, and Jack O'Sullivan had a tie strain, so they're back. Joey Carberry, Jack Crowley, and that, Gavin Coombs and Roman Salano have been released back. So Jack Crowley coming back is uh, he needs a game. Um, but yeah, it's actually 100%. a big boost for him coming back into the into the fold and probably be a little first bit frustrated in the last few weeks that um Ross Bourne got ahead of him basically. He was yeah. he was picked ahead of him in November, but he needs a match and uh, that's a bit of a boost for Munster to get him back, isn't it? Do you do you so obviously Joey's been playing really well now for the last few weeks. Do you keep Joey in and Jack on the bench where it's Ben Healy you play, stands. You, you, you play the two of them. You play the two of them. 10, 12. Yeah, yeah you do. You play him or, yeah, you yeah. know, you just get him out in the field. Uh, Mike Haley is, hasn't been there at full back, so maybe one of them could go full back if they don't play 12. I think you get the two of them out in the field. They're yeah, two I'd like to see players. Peckato and Frisch. Um, yeah, so maybe you put one of them full back and you just get him out in the field and you, you, you monster will try and keep building. I think... Scarlet to be very mindful of Munster's attack and their pace. Um, they're going to try and figure out how do they stop them. Um, and when I mentioned uh, those couple of players, they're going to be quite physical and they're going to. This is going to be a mm-hmm. physical challenge. This isn't going to be like um, the Ospreys game the last day. If anyone is yeah. expecting, I think Munster have been playing really well. Um, but Scarlets, I think, will will be really physical on Friday night and. Um, it should be an interesting game, a very important game again for for Munster, um, for Scarlets, you know, to try and start winning games and and push themselves up the table. I think it's going to be really difficult for them to get into the, you know, the playoff spot, or to qualify for Europe, which is disappointing for them. But it's certainly one to look forward to this week. Um, yeah. Alex Nankavell, uh, Munster's signing, new signing from next year from the Chiefs. He was class. Um, he played against the Crusaders. They won thirty one ten in. In Christchurch, and John Ryan came off the bench. It's worth just mentioning that it's uh, an incredible win. Like when you yeah. think the Chiefs can go there and, and beat the Crusaders, um, but it was nice to see John Ryan. Um, Unbelievable first play run really too. Well. I don't know Nanky if you saw it, was, but... yeah, and Nanky yeah. was really good as well. So it was, um, it was, uh, it was nice to see that. Um, that's all the, the news we have, Neve. You've no other news around. Uh, no. Around Munster um, at the moment. Um, unfortunately, as I said, and we spoke about Tom at the start, so our thoughts and prayers are with him. T- and, um, you know, we'll always be thinking about Tom. He was part of that Munster, an Irish family, rugby family, and uh, he was a very special fella and a great character. Um, so 
We'll be back next week to talk about, um, you know, look back in the, the Monster Scarlets game. Enjoy your week. Thanks, Neve. Thanks, Alan. The Red 78 with Alan Quinlan and Neve Briggs. Nobody knows Monster Rugby better. I'd like to think I know a lot. <laughs>